Welcome to the sixth and final section of this class where we will talk about some advanced topics like knowledge objects, deployment servers, users roles in authentication, lookups, and we'll tell you where to go from here. Let's get started. Welcome back. In this segment we are going to talk about deployment and forwarder management. In a distributed environment you set up a Splunk deployment server that manages groups of Splunk Enterprise instances, forwarders, indexers, and the like from a central location. It identifies clients and subscribes them to certain server classes. If you have used other automation tools like Chef or Puppet, you're familiar with this type of model. And by the way, you can use Chef or Puppet to do the same thing. A server class defines a group of Splunk deployment apps and adds them to its member criteria. Each client of a server class reconciles its apps with the server, so if it's missing any, it pulls them from the deployment server. For example, if you set up a server class that was Microsoft Windows Domain Controllers, and those domain controllers needed a Splunk heavy forwarder, then each domain controller that talked back to this Splunk deployment server would reconcile whether it has the appropriate app on it or not. And if it doesn't, the client would pull that app from the deployment server. Deployment apps are located in Etsy deployment apps on the Splunk deployment server. In smaller instances of Splunk, the Splunk search head might double as the deployment server. Like this. For example, let's take the Splunk app for Windows Infrastructure, a very popular app. If the Splunk search head is the same machine as the Splunk deployment server, you'll have a directory called apps, or the regular Windows apps lie, Windows, Microsoft Active Directory, and the DNS app. And then you'll have another folder called deployment apps, where it will have Windows, Windows Domain Controllers, and Windows PowerShell deployment apps. To manage deployment servers, go to Settings, Distributed Environment, and then Forwarder Management. And let's take a look at how that works. All right, in our Splunk instance, if we go to Settings, under Distributed Environment, let's go to Forwarder Management. And first of all, it's going to show me all of the forwarders that are currently calling home. And I can create server classes by clicking on the server classes tab. So I have a server class for AD domain controllers and it has three apps. Let's take a look at that. So the three apps each AD domain controller needs that I've specified is this PowerShell app, send to indexer app, and the TA technology add-on domain controller 2012. And once I add the servers that I want in this server class in the include box, including wildcards, I simply click on save and then Splunk says okay all apps deployed successfully. We have these three Windows deployment apps, we have this action taken after installation, and then it counts the number of clients deployed. So that's how you set up a basic server class within forwarder management. And as always I thank you for joining me in this segment and I'll see you next time. Welcome back. In this segment I'm going to talk about users, roles, and authentication in Splunk. To get to this area in the Splunk web interface, you simply go to Settings and then Access Controls at the bottom right. Users can be defined locally, and they can also be defined in a directory service like LDAP or Active Directory. In Splunk, just like in many other pieces of software, users are assigned to roles and roles take on specific capabilities. Splunk comes with five built-in roles and you can also make your own roles if you are an administrator. Admin, which has rights to everything by default except that can delete role, which I'll talk about in a minute. We have power user, we have standard user, we have can delete, and we have the Splunk system role. The Splunk system role is the role that Splunk uses sort of in the background to run the Splunk engine. The can delete role is not assigned to any user by default and I actually recommend you leave it unassigned unless you actually want to delete an index. Then you can assign it to yourself temporarily and delete an index using the search tool and you just query that index, index equals whichever index you want to delete, 
and then pipe, and then the word delete. And if you have that can delete role, you will be able to delete that entire index. As I said, Splunk administrators can create custom roles. Some apps come with custom roles as well. So Win for Admin comes with the Splunk app for Windows infrastructure, and VMware Admin comes with the Splunk app for VMware. If you install these apps, and you do not assign users to either of these roles, your users will not be able to view the contents of those apps. There are several authentication options in Splunk. As I said earlier, local, which is just an authentication method on that particular Splunk environment. And you manage all users' roles and permissions locally on that environment. There's LDAP, or Active Directory. You can use a SAML token, and you can do scripted single sign-on. The first two are the ones that are important for this class. And actually, Splunk recommends the second one on that list. Splunk recommends using LDAP to manage user authentication, LDAP or Active Directory, because then you can manage roles and users the same way that you manage roles and users within your organization and so it ties into that central directory and management tool that you probably already have in your organization. So let's look at setting up an LDAP and Splunk calls it a strategy. So we go to settings, access controls, and then authentication method and we choose LDAP on the uh, external part there. We choose LDAP and then click that blue link that says LDAP settings. And here's the screen where Splunk displays all of our current LDAP strategies. And if there are no LDAP strategies, we simply click on New to create one. And it brings up a bunch of fields that we need to fill in. So the LDAP strategy name is any name that you want. The host is your LDAP domain controller. The default ports under port is either 389 if you're not using SSL or 636 if you are using SSL. You may need to talk to your directory services group at your organization in order to find out which ports they are using. And tick that box there if SSL is enabled. The bind D Welcome back. In this segment I want to talk about Splunk configuration files. Configuration files govern almost every aspect of how Splunk behaves. 
anytime you change something or create something in the web GUI, it writes it to a configuration file. A Splunk app is nothing more than a set of configuration files. Configuration files contain settings, knowledge objects, and other behavioral attributes of Splunk, including forwarding information, indexing information, receiving information, parsing information, and everything else that governs Splunk's behavior. So you can sort of see the importance of knowing what configuration files in Splunk are. And they are Linux-like, but we can edit them and use them in Windows. They end in .conf. And they are multi-layered, as we will see. Here's what a typical Splunk installation directory structure looks like. We have Splunk Home, which is in Windows, C colon program files, Splunk. In Linux, it's opt Splunk. And in that Splunk home folder, we have the bin folder, the Etsy folder, and the var folder. And our indexes are stored in var lib Splunk. Our license and configuration files are all in the Etsy folder. And our executables are in the bin folder. And if you remember, we used the bin folder to do things like stop and restart Splunk. So if we navigate to our Etsy folder, and then system, and then local, this is where our main configuration files exist, the ones that come with Splunk. Each app has its own set of configuration files as well. So the search app has a set of configuration files, the launcher app, and any other app we install really is just a collection of configuration files. And notice that configuration files have the same names. So how does Splunk differentiate which configurations to use during which time and in which app context. First of all, let's take a look at what a very basic configuration file might look like. Configuration files are really just text files. They end in .conf, conf, and they have stanzas and attributes. A stanza or stanza header is in square brackets, and then underneath it are all the attributes for that stanza. So attribute equals value. Here's a very simple outputs.conf. This is the Splunk configuration file that tells an app where to send its data. And of course, we usually, at least in this class, configure this within the Splunk GUI. But it actually writes this to the outputs.conf file. The stanza is tcp out colon Splunk underscore indexer, and the attribute is server equals and then the IP address colon and then the port. So that is a legitimate outputs.conf file, although that's a very simple example. There are default configuration files that don't have specific settings. They're meant for you to copy over into the local directory if you want to modify them. Do not modify the configuration files found in slash default. Those are the ones that come with Splunk, and they're kind of like the example configuration files. The configuration files that you can modify, you should copy the files from default into the local directory before you modify them. And here's an important point to make. When Splunk starts, configuration files are merged into a single runtime model. Remember all those files that had the same file name? Well, Splunk's not really looking at the file name. It's looking at the stanzas inside the configuration files. And if there are no duplicate stanzas, the resulting runtime model is the union of all files. If there are conflicts, meaning if there are the same stanza in multiple files, then the setting with the highest precedence is used. And here's how Splunk determines precedence. The number one precedence is the system local directory. Second is the app local directories. Third is the app default directories. And fourth is the system default directories. So if you installed Splunk and didn't do any configurations or anything, it would go all the way down to number four because there would be no other configurations or apps, and it would just run Splunk in the default way right after you install it. There are four main configuration files, and some apps have additional ones. But inputs.conf defines data inputs. Outputs.conf defines forwarding behavior. Props.conf defines indexing, property configurations, custom source type rules, and much more. Props.conf is a very important configuration file. And limits.conf defines various limits for search commands.
That was a brief overview of configuration files, and going into a deep dive of configuration files is kind of beyond the scope of this class, but there are so many resources out there to understand configuration files. I would recommend going to docs.splunk.com first of all. And I thank you for joining me in this segment, and I'll see you next time.